And how is everyone? Hey, it's Labor Day weekend. It's the last beach, official beach weekend, and I'm glad that you're here today. And we have some of our folks that are traveling for the weekend, but I'm glad you're here today. Uh, I want to walk you through a few announcements here. So to kind of remind you what's going on, our nursery is open, children's church is available, and we're abiding by all the COVID safeguards, sanitizing everything, taking temperatures of your children to make sure everyone is okay. Here's the next one. We're starting a new ministry called CREW, and you see it stands for Christians Ready, Equipped, and Willing. And this is about doing some mission work in our community, in our surrounding area, helping people with projects and things like that. So, for example, we built a handicap ramp for Jasper Bird. We would love to do things for other folks. And so if you know people who need assistance, need help, we would love to help them. And you can contact Keith or Deb Sargent there with the phone numbers. And uh, we would love to be a part of that. Also, we need a couple of nursery volunteers if you can help with that. Uh, see Debbie Wood or Jill Fetner. In addition to that, we also have uh, what's the next one? There we go. Help for Miss Ruth on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. If you can come in and uh, help her out, I know she would greatly appreciate it. The Revelation Bible Study started this past Wednesday night. We'd like 22 of you here for that first one. Glad you were back. And also on the 20th, our new members class starts at nine o'clock upstairs. And uh, please wear your mask and all that if you're interested in being a member. And as I've told you, there's three ways to give. You can give in person, by mail, or online, all right? Is that the last one? I made them Thursday. I can't remember. I guess that's it. All right. You ready to, to jump into God's Word? Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks and praise again. This is the day you have made. We want to rejoice and be glad in it. We are reminded, oh God, that you are our shepherd. We are reminded, oh God, that you're a good God that you seek just our best because you are the best. And though at times life is unfair, it is harsh, we still trust and believe that you are a good God in the midst of all of this. So the Lord, as again we jump into uh, Psalm 23 and Matthew 6 today, we want to take to heart the lessons that we can apply to our life from these. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're in this series called God is Good All the Time, and all the time God is good. And if you weren't here last week, uh, you can download that introductory sermon. We looked at four uh, things that happened to it, four consequences that happen when we forget about the goodness of God, all right? And so you can go back and look at that. And today, we are moving slowly into Psalm 23, if you'll notice on your outline as well as Matthew 6. We're going to look at an issue I think none of you ever have to worry about at all. It never crosses your mind. You never deal with it. It's the issue of worry, all right? I know none of you worry. You, you don't ever worry about anything. You just trust God for everything. But we're going to look and remind ourselves today about what God has to say about that. And I think one of the reasons we worry is that we tend to forget about the goodness of God. Life hits us, and all of a sudden our first thought isn't the goodness of God. And so today, I want us to see what God has to say about worry. And then next Sunday, we will look at how do we apply the goodness of God in our life when worry hits us, okay? So before we do that, I want to remind you of three fundamental truths we kind of looked at last week. I've redone them today and about the goodness of God. Here's the first one. As my shepherd, God, not these other gods, should be the sole security of everything I need to live. It's so easy for us to turn to other gods like the government or our IRA or our retirement or turn to people, or turn to our career, turn to our job, turn to our education. And when something happens to us, we think if it's to be, it's up to me. I got to jump in. I got to fix this. I got to take care of this. I got to do this. And in the process, we leave out the goodness of God. We don't go to God first. And I'm challenging all of us to remind ourselves that God is the sole security of everything, not Wall Street, not Social Security, not your income, okay? And if you're going to put your security in something, right, if you're going to put your security in something, you need to put it in something that can never be taken from you. I mean, if you put it into something that can be taken from you, that's not very secure. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of our older folks who've invested a lot in uh, Wall Street. And as the market goes up, they make money. And as it goes down, they lose money. And so if we put all of our security in that basket, we're going to find ourselves coming up short. And you can lose your health. You can lose your family. You can use your job. You can lose all kinds of things in life. You can even uh, you lose your mind, all right? 
So the key to dealing with all of this is to remind ourselves never to put our security in something that we can take from us. If you do, you're into big trouble. So what should we do? We should put our security in something that cannot be taken from you. And what is that? Your relationship to God. No one can take that from you. No one can touch that. No one can harm that. And so instead of putting our security in other things, we need to put our security in our relationship to God. And so that brings me to Psalm 23. So if you've got your Bibles uh, there on your outline, you'll see it as well. It begins this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The New English translation puts it this way. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. And so when I read that, my first question is, what is a shepherd? And what does a shepherd do? I doubt, how many of you grew up raising sheep? Keith, one. One guy in the whole church raised sheep, all right? Uh, most of us, grew, I grew up on a farm, but we didn't have sheep. We had, every, we had a lot of other animals, but we, we didn't have sheep. And so to kind of prepare for this, I went and read a lot about sheep. You know, it's interesting. And one book I read by Dan Phillips called The Lord is My Shepherd, Meditations Based on the 23rd Psalm for Sheep. He writes this, sheep are incredibly defenseless. They have a lot of natural predators. They're not fast. Uh, they can't run. They don't have claws. They don't have teeth with sharp incisors that can bite. On top of that, they're typically not the most intelligent animals. <laughs> sheep do not have great depth perception either. This is what makes them very susceptible to making poor judgment decisions about where they go. This is why sheep will go off a cliff because they, they don't have good depth perception. They'll get into danger. Uh, their natural tendency is to follow a leader, and that is whichever sheep moves first. There's no such thing as an alpha sheep. Whichever sheep moves, the rest of them go, and they just follow that sheep wherever they go, okay? Um, sheep get stressed if they get separated from the flock. Sheep are not self-sufficient. And that's why they need a shepherd, someone to defend them. Yet sheep, I found this interesting. Sheep have the ability to learn human faces and voices, and they can even differentiate our emotions from our facial expressions. So when you're happy, they'll know it. And if you're upset, they will know it. Okay? But remember, they're not the most intelligent animals on the planet. Isn't it interesting? The main word God uses for his people is sheep. Because sometimes we're not the most intelligent people on the planet. Even Jesus called us sheep. Look at this in John 10. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. My sheep know my voice, and I know them. And if you are around, ever around the different flocks of sheep with different shepherds, those sheep know their own shepherd's voice, and they will come to him or to her. And Jesus said we should know his voice. And so what does a shepherd do? I mean, besides just watch over them. A shepherd does these three things. He feeds, he leads, and he meets the needs of those sheep. He feeds, he leads, and he meets the needs of those sheep. That's what a shepherd does, all right? God wants to feed you. He wants to lead you, okay? He wants to meet your needs. And as a result of that, God says, I'm here for you. I will meet all of your needs if you will trust me. I'm the good shepherd. Come to me first. Don't go to anything else. And as our good shepherd, and because we're sheep, we have different needs based on where we are in life. Sometimes you need protection. Sometimes you need encouragement. Sometimes you need a, a little time to rethink some things. Sometimes you need to be fed. Sometimes you need sleep. You've heard me say sometimes, uh, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Because we burn the candle at both ends. Okay? And so you, sometimes you just need to take a nap. Yesterday we worked in the yard about all day long. Okay? And it was exhausting. I mean exhausting. And uh, we were, I was pulling up roots. We had these roots about this big. We'd cut down a tree years ago, but they didn't get the roots out, so I just waited till they rotted. So I'm pulling them out, and it's just tearing up my nice grass in the backyard as I'm doing it. But I got them all out. We got them all out. We got bags and bags and bags and bags of them. So after that, I went upstairs, took a shower, and I took a nap. Because sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap, okay? And if you are a dad, you are to be the shepherd over your children. You, you are to feed them, lead them. If you're a mom, you're to be the shepherd over your children. You're to feed and lead and meet the needs of them, of your children. You have a shepherd's role. If you are in management, 
You, are, you supervise employees. You are to be a shepherd. You're supposed to lead them and feed them and meet their needs. If you are serving in any capacity of our church as a leader of any way, any kind, you're a shepherd. The people who work with you, who serve alongside of you, who minister with you, you to feed, lead, and meet their needs. As a leader, you serve them. We, we don't ask them to serve us. And by the way, do you know what the Greek word for shepherd is? It's this Greek word, poimen. The root word means to protect, and it's also the New Testament word for pastor. I am a shepherd. My job is to feed you, to lead you, and to meet your needs. And if you teach a Sunday school class or you are over a small group in our church, you are a shepherd. You're to feed those people, lead those people, and meet the needs of those people. Here's the second fundamental truth about the goodness of God. As my shepherd, God alone is able to supply every need I have. It's a biblical truth we accept, but we don't always put into practice. God alone can meet every need you have. And we're going to look at this in depth over the next three months from Psalm 23. In Philippians 4.19, Paul writes, God will supply all you need from his glorious resources in Christ Jesus. I want you to circle something there on your outline, and that is circle in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, God will meet every need you have. God's goodness is not based on your goodness. It's based on his goodness. You don't have to be good for God to be good to you. The Bible tells us he calls us the sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He allows unjust people to breathe and have a life just like he allows us. So it's not about your goodness or my goodness. It's all about the goodness of God. Here's the third biblical truth about God's goodness. As my shepherd, God commands me not to worry about anything. Nothing. Nada. Zip. Zero. You don't have to worry about anything. What's anything? Anything. You don't have to worry about anything. God says, you don't need to worry. I will take care of every need you have. In Philippians 4, 6, it says this. Don't worry about anything. So, that's pretty clear. The Greek word that's translated here as worry is merimantado. And it it's, and grammatically, in Greek, it's what we call an imperative. And anytime there's an imperative in Greek, it's a command. God's not suggesting that you not worry. He's commanding you not to worry. And we worry about all kinds of things in life. He says, do not worry. Okay? Don't worry. Now, don't worry about anything. But what's the rest of the Philippians say? Do not worry about anything. Instead... Pray about everything. So we don't worry about anything, but we're to pray about everything. I, I've said this many times over the years. You can pray or you can panic. I can worry or I can worship. And if you're worshiping God, worry goes out the back door. God says, I don't want you worrying about anything. I want you praying about it. I want you worshiping me. Keep your eyes on me. If you'll keep your eyes on me rather than anything else, I will meet your needs. I'll take care of those. Now, for this morning, we're going to use the Sermon on the Mount as the basis to talk about worry, since we're commanded not to worry. And I want to give you some reasons why we should never worry biblically. Okay? Jesus gives us five good reasons from the Sermon on the Mount. Here's the first one. Worry is unreasonable. It's just unreasonable. By that I mean it's irrational. It's illogical. It doesn't make sense to worry. Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, and don't worry about your body or what you'll wear. Your life is far more important than clothes. Clothes don't make the man or a woman. Jesus says, I'm commanding you, don't worry about anything. And why? Because there's basically three reasons why worry is unreasonable. Here's the first one. We typically worry about the wrong thing. Many of you will recognize the name Pastor John Hagee. Um, he tells a story of a woman in his church he had known for 25 years. 
And every time she would come up to him, he would ask her how she's doing. She goes, I don't know. I got this ache. I think it's cancer. And that was her typical response. For 25 years, she had cancer. 25 years. No matter what it was, headache, knee ache, I think it's cancer. I think it's cancer. Well, how are you doing today? I, th I think I got cancer. She died several years ago, near 90 years of age, never got cancer. She wasted nearly her entire adult life worrying about the wrong thing. And we worry about the wrong thing. How do I look? We have an inspection in our house before we come to church. Don't we, Emmy? Okay? But we often worry about the wrong thing. How do I look? Is my hair right? Are my shoes tied? Do I have on the right clothes? And the problem is, it's all temporary. It's not going to matter. If you're really going to worry, and God says you, you shouldn't worry, but if you're really going to worry, then you should worry about things that are eternal, not external. I mean, worry about something's going to matter 10 years from now, or 100 years from now, or 1,000 years from now, even though we're not to worry. If you're going to focus on something, focus on something that's eternal, not external. Here's a second reason why worry is unreasonable. We worry about things we have no control over, nor can we change them. If you can't change it, why are you worrying about it? If you can't change it, change it. I mean, to me, it's foolish to worry about stuff we have no control over. Because worry won't change anything at all but you. I read a, a, a lot of research on worry, and one guy, his name is Lucas Lefinnery, he has done a long-term study for years on the effects of worry. He says this, This is what breaks my heart about worry. It makes you miserable in the present moment to try and prevent misery in the future. For chronic warriors, this process leads them to be continually distressed all of their lives in order to avoid later events that really never happen. Worry sucks the joy out of the here and now. He had thousands of participants participate in his study, and at 10 o'clock each night, they were to write down two things, what they had worried about during the day, and guess how much time they focused on worrying about it. And then 20 days later, he would meet with them to see what happened. And here's what he discovered. The research found that 91.4% of what these people worried about never actually happened. Now, if you're like me, all right, what about the other 8.6%? <laughs> they discovered that 8.6%, though, it didn't even come close to happening the way they thought it would by worrying about it. Jesus says it's irrational to worry because we think worry is some form of control, okay? I'm controlling it. I mean, if you're worried about your kids who are out late at night and you don't know where they are, you can't control them. We just have apps on our phone so we know where Emmy is 24-7. That's how we solve that problem. And we know who she's with, okay? It's simple. If I can't control it, why am I worried about it? Here's a third reason worry is unreasonable. When we worry about anything, that worry keeps getting bigger in your mind. Because you get stuck on it. You keep focusing on it. It dominates your mind. It controls you. It stresses you out. Somebody criticizes you, and all of a sudden you're worried about what they said. They make some off the comment to you, and you just, well, why did they say that? And then you think about it all day. It just ruins your day. They probably forgot about it. Maybe they were just in a bad mood. They had a bad burrito the night before, and they just dumped on you. And in our house, we know this. All of a sudden, one of us is upset, and we get short with the other, and we say, I'm sorry. I was really mad about this or upset about this. I'm sorry I took it out on you. A lot of times people do that. They're not trying to be hurtful intentionally, okay? But we get all worried about it. And, and as we think about it, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It mushrooms in our head, okay? So the first reason we're not to worry, it's unreasonable. Here's the second reason Jesus says we should not worry. Worry is unnatural. Nothing in nature worries. Human beings are the only thing God created that ever worries. Ants don't worry. Cows don't worry. Plants don't worry. Rocks don't worry. Horses don't worry. The only thing that worries are people. 
we, re, we worry in rebellion against God because we're commanded not to worry. So it's unnatural. You weren't made to worry. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us two lessons from nature. One is a biological lesson it's about animals, and one's a botany lesson about plants to show that in nature none of these creatures ever worry. Look what he says in Matthew. Look at the birds. Do you think they worry about their existence? They don't plant or reap or store up food, yet your heavenly Father provides them each with food. Aren't you much more valuable to your Father than they are? God says, look, I take care of the little bitty birds. I make sure they get fed. They don't worry about a thing. They never sweat this. So why are you sweating things? And then he gives us a lesson to botany with plants. Look at verses 28 through 29. Why worry about your clothes? Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs, yet King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautiful as they are. You ever looked at a flower really up close? I mean, look at the detail of a flower, how intricate they are, how beautiful they are. I mean, just take any ordinary wildflower. You'll, if you just take time to look at one closely, you'll be amazed at how detailed God is. That flower that you're looking at isn't going, I wonder what's going to happen to me. Am I going to end up in a vase and die? Flowers don't think that. They don't worry about anything. God says, look, just look at nature. Look at animals. Look at plants. Nothing in all of my creation ever worries but you. I'm providing to nature. I provide to animals. I provide for plants, and I'll provide for you. Jesus says animals don't worry. Plants don't worry. So why are you? It's unnatural for you and me to worry because nothing in nature worries. Jesus says, listen, trust me, come to me when you have a heartache, when you have a hurt, when you have a doubt, when you have a need, come to me first. Worry's unnatural. All it's going to do is stress you out. It's going to make you a mess. I mean, I've had people say to me, I was, uh, 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 I was born a warrior. Really? Yeah, my mama was a warrior. Well, if your mama was a serial killer, would you be one too? Worry is learned. You learn it by watching other people. This means worry is contagious. A baby doesn't worry. Oh, yeah, when they need changing, they let you know. When they're hungry, they let you know. But they don't worry. Anything that can be learned can be unlearned. You don't have to live the rest of your life as a worry wart. Getting uptight, getting stressed, getting ulcers, getting headaches, getting migraines. God says worry is unnatural. Christian Holocaust survivor and author Corey Tim Boone writes, Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. She goes on to say, When I worry, I go to the mirror and say to myself, This tremendous thing which is worrying me is beyond a solution. It is especially too hard for Jesus Christ to handle. After I say that, I smile and then I'm ashamed. Because she didn't take it first to God. So if you can learn to worry, you can learn to unworry. And some of you, you're pros at it. You got not just a bachelor's, but you got a master's and PhD in it. I mean, you could teach others how to worry. In verse 26, Jesus said, Your father sees what the birds need. Listen to what he says. He doesn't say, You're God who's the father of the birds. He doesn't say, your God, who's the father of plants, he says, your father. God's only a father to us. He's not a father to cows. He's not a father to ants. He's not a father to dogs. You and I are distinctly different because we're the only thing in creation that was made in God's image. We represent him. When people look at us, they should see him. I mean, I've driven by many, I mean, we had cows growing up. I have never seen one of our cows pray. I've never seen one of our dogs pray. Now, we have terriers. They pray, P-R-E-Y, because they catch everything that comes in the backyard. But I've never seen them saying, Lord, thank you for this food I'm about to kill. I've never seen that happen. They don't worry, okay? Why? Worry is unnatural. God says, I will meet every one of your needs if you will trust me. So worry is unreasonable. It's unnatural. Here's the third thing Jesus says about worry. Worry is unhelpful. Meaning it's useless. It's worthless. 
Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 27. Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? The answer is no. You actually take time from your life by worrying. There's enough medical history, enough medical data and research to show that if you worry, you are shortening your life. You're also creating all kinds of problems, stress in your life. Worry can't make you an inch taller. It can't make you an inch shorter. It can't make you bigger or smaller, thinner or fatter. Worry doesn't work, Jesus says. It never has. It's unhelpful. He says, if you can change something, change it. And if you can't, there's no need to worry about it. Worry about any problem in your life. You will never move one step towards solving it. Worry is stewing without doing. It's like being in a rocking chair. You're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But you're not moving anywhere. You've made no progress. And worry is just stewing without brewing. Okay? Worry can't change anything except you. It will make you miserable. It will cause you and your health to have problems. I mean, for example, worry can't change your past. Why are you worried about your past? It's in the past. There's nothing you do about it. Worry cannot control your future. No matter how much you think you can, you are not controlling it by worrying about it. If you can change the past, okay, if you can't change the past and you can't control the future, what does it do? Worry messes up today. It's like Corey Tim Boone. It just steals the joy from today. It keeps you from enjoying today because you're so focused about what you're worried about, you can't enjoy what you have now. It keeps you stewing without doing. It just ruins where you are today. It's unnatural. It's unhelpful. Look at Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down. Anyone want to give a testimony to that one? It weighs you down. You probably have had some things in your life you worried about. It just weighted you down, okay? You think about all this stuff, and you start worrying about it. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to have disappointment with it. You're going to be despaired with it. You're going to get depressed with it. That's what worry does. God tells you that your body was not designed to worry. Because why? It's unnatural. You weren't made to worry. And every time you swallow your worry, okay, Here's your next feeling. Every time you swallow your worry, your stomach keeps score. Why do you think so many people have ulcers? Indigestion problems. They worry. It tears you up. It messes you up. I, I hear people say, oh, my aching back. Oh, I just got a headache. Or my stomach's upset. Why? Oh, they're just worrying. Because you weren't made to worry. And anytime you internalize that worry, your body's going to pay a price for it. It's unnatural. It's unhelpful. It's unhealthy. People who worry don't live as long as those who do not worry. People say, I'm, I'm just worried sick. Yes, you are. You've made yourself sick. It creates stomach problems, insomnia. It creates backaches. It creates headaches. It causes more fatigue than even work. Research has shown that if you go put in a hard day at work, you come home, you might be a little tired, but if you haven't worried about anything, you're fine. But if you're at work all day working hard and you're worrying about something all day, you come home, you're exhausted. Worry will wear you out more than a good day's work. But the opposite is also true. Look at the book of Proverbs. A heart at peace gives life to what? The body. You want to be healthier? Stop worrying. Do you want less stress? Stop worrying. Because a heart at peace, meaning a heart that's not worrying, it gives life to the body. You might find this interesting. Uh, Christian author Robert Morgan in his book entitled Worry Less, Love More writes this. That I found this rather interesting. How many of you have a, a, an Amazon account? Right, you can be honest, we have one. Any of you use Kindle? You, you like to read books online or anything like that? If you do, Amazon's tracking you. Get this. Amazon keeps track of your highlights. When you're reading something in Kindle and you go, I like that quote, and you highlight it, they record it. Everything that's highlighted, or if you make a note on your, on your online account, through your tablet or what, they're keeping a record. When an ebook owner marks sentences, the online retailer knows and notes it. Recently, Amazon released a list of the most popular passages in some of its best-selling books, such as The Hunger Games, Harry Potter series, Pride and Prejudice. 
Also, they released this, the most highlighted Bible verse online. I, I was surprised. I thought it'd be like John 3, 16. No. I thought it might be something like from Psalm 23. Nope. Do you know what the number one verse is highlighted online, according to Amazon? Here it is. Philippians 4. Do not be anxious. Do not worry about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is the number one verse that is highlighted, marked, notated through Kindle, according to Amazon. It says something to me. We're trying to remind ourselves we don't need to worry. So you can learn to trust God or you can worry. It's unhelpful, it's unnatural, it's unreasonable. Here's the fourth thing Jesus says about worry. Worry is unnecessary. And he shows us this from the Sermon on the Mount. He's going, why are you worrying about so many things? There's need to worry because God, who's your good shepherd, he's going to take care of you, he'll provide. He's promised to meet every one of your needs. Remember, as your good shepherd, he's going to feed you, he's going to lead you, he's going to meet your needs. He'll take care of you. In a recent publication by the New York Times, it says this, of all countries in the world, you think of all the number of countries in the world, Americans are the most anxious, stressed out, worried people on the planet. Now, how can a group of people who have everything be the most worried, stressed out people on the planet. Since we're more stressed out, more worried than people that live in hunger-prone nations like Nigeria, Lebanon, and Ukraine. We spend billions of dollars every year on anti-anxiety medications and additional millions to fund research into the causes and cures for anxiety disorders. It said that they had this article called, The Kids Are Not Right. Americans, Teens Are Anxious, Depressed, and Overwhelmed. The article claimed that since 9-11, kids who've grown up since then have grown up in an era of economic and national insecurity. They've never known a time when there wasn't terrorism or school shootings. They've, never, they've watched their parents worry about everything under the sun. And by the time these kids hit puberty, technology becomes their enemy. They're so attached to their phones due to social media, it is creating another generation of stressed out kids. One expert said, if you want to create an environment to churn out angst people, you've done it with technology. One teenager explained it this way. My generation is the first generation that cannot escape our problems at all. We're like little volcanoes. We're getting this constant pressure from our phones, from our relationships, from the way things are today. And thus, we are stressed out, worried, fearful of what's coming next. Our teenagers today are so conscious. I mean, they're never free of this. They're always. If you watch them, they're always like, they're always on this. And it's creating all kinds of anxiety. And if you worry, you are worrying about things that really is God's responsibility to be responsible for. Here's what worry is. Worry is assuming responsibility that God never intended you to have. God says, it's my job to meet your needs, not yours. Trust me. He says, you're playing God when you think it's up to you to take care of your needs. You're saying, I don't have a heavenly father. I don't have a good shepherd who's going to feed, lead, and meet my needs. You will never worry if you understand that God is your heavenly father and you understand the goodness of God. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew 6, 30. He says this, And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, in other words, they're only going to bloom for a few days, and then they're gone, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? I want you to circle a phrase there. He will certainly care for you. God will care for you. God says it's my responsibility to take care of your needs because you are valuable to him. You're created in his image. And if you want to wonder how much value you are, just look at the cross. Jesus did not die on the cross for cows and animals and plants. He died for us. Salvation is only does. If you want to know how much he loves you, that's where you look. God says, look at the cross. That shows you I'm your good shepherd. That shows you that I love you. That shows you that I'm going to take care of all your needs. And what's my point? Every time you worry, 
It comes from the fact that you misunderstand the goodness of God. Worry is a warning sign. It's a yellow caution light beeping that's saying, at this point, I've forgotten how good God is. I've forgotten the promises of God. I've forgotten that God has promised to meet all my needs. God says it over and over and over in this book called the Bible. I will meet your needs. I will take care of your needs. But then we don't trust him. We don't believe him. We think if it's to be, it's up to me. God says, I will meet every need in your life. And worry simply means you've forgotten about the goodness of God. And we always get into trouble every time we forget about the goodness of God. We always do. We start thinking, well, God's he's not going to take care of this for me. He really doesn't love me. He loves Franklin Graham more than he loves me. So I better just sit here and worry and get ulcers and headaches and make myself sick. And every time you start down that path, it's a blind alley. You're going to come to a dead end. Most of you sitting here this morning are believers. And most of you listening to me online this morning, you're believers in Christ. You said, I put my trust in Jesus to save me from my sins because in my own goodness, I'm not good enough. I cannot save myself. I, there's nothing I can do to get myself into heaven. I just have to throw myself at the mercy of God, say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me through your grace. Save me. I want you to be my Savior and Lord because in my own goodness, I'm not good enough. This is why worrying is illogical. When Jesus died on the cross, he, he solved your greatest need. You don't have any bigger problem than eternal salvation. And if that's your biggest problem, why in the world are you worried about everything else? I mean, I find it illogical to say, I trust Jesus to get me to heaven, but I don't trust him to meet my needs here. I mean, if you can trust him with your biggest problem, eternal salvation, why can't you trust him to meet the rest of your needs? Things like, when am I supposed to marry? Who am I supposed to marry? Should I take this job? Those kind of things. He's already met your biggest need, eternal salvation. And it doesn't make any sense to me to say, I don't trust God to meet my needs. Oh, I trust him to get me to heaven, but I don't trust him with anything until then. It makes no sense to me. It's like if I'm walking down College Road, you see me out here on this uh, trail, and you pull over and you say, Pastor Kelly, would you like a ride? Sure. I've got a big old backpack on my back, and I get into the car with you, and about five minutes later, we're riding down the road, and you go, well, Pastor Kelly, why don't you take that backpack off and throw it in the back? Oh, no, 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 no. It's just enough for you to carry me there. I'll, I'll still carry the backpack. That's stupid logic. This is stupid to say, God, I trust you to get me to heaven, but I don't trust you to take care of me here. So I'll worry about money. I'll worry about sex. I'll worry about relationships. I'll worry about my social life. I'll worry about my career. I'll worry about my health. I'll worry about friendships. I'll worry about my relationships. But I trust you to get me to heaven. No, you don't. You just get rid of that backpack called worry. Ditch it. Worry is unnecessary. Here's the fifth and final thing Jesus says about worry. Worry is unbelief. It's doubting God. God has promised in this book called the Bible, I'll meet every one of your needs. I'll take care of every need you have if you just hand them over to me. And when you don't trust God to do that, you're acting like an unbeliever. Every time you worry, you act like an unbeliever. You're calling God a liar. Can I make it any more blunt? God says, I've promised to meet your needs. Well, really. (laughs) You're calling him a liar. In Philippians 4.19, it says this. You can be sure. That means it's not a wish, it's not a hope. You can be sure. What? That God will take care of most of your needs, part of your needs? No. God will take care of everything you need. You know, I love Greek, so I looked that word up in the Greek. What does everything mean? You'll be shocked. You know what it means in the original Greek? Everything. Everything. If you will just trust him, he'll meet everything in your life. Everything you need because of what Jesus has done for us. You just got to trust him. God is good to everybody. As I said earlier, he doesn't relate to us because of our goodness. He relates to us because of his goodness. Like I said, he... He gives people who are lost life and health, success, 
like he does us. They get food. He takes care of their needs. And if he's going to take care of them, he'll take care of us. And what Philippians 4.19 is saying is this. God's going to take care of every need you have. Every time you worry, you're doubting God. Have you ever thought about that? That's why worry is a sin. You see, we're commanded not to worry. So when we worry, we're committing sin. We're saying, I don't believe you, God. I don't trust you, God. This is why Jesus puts it the way he does. People who don't know God and the way he works are always what? <laughs> Worrying about these things. See, if you don't understand the goodness of God and you don't trust the goodness of God, you're going to be a worry wart. Now, let me be honest with you. If you haven't made Jesus your shepherd, the Lord and Savior of your life, you've got a lot to worry about. You really do. Because you have no one to help you. You have no one to go to. It's up to you or whatever you turn to to cope with when it doesn't turn out the way you want. You're not depending on God's goodness. You're depending on your own. And if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, you're in big trouble. And I would encourage you at the end of our service to give your life to Christ. Just humble yourself and say, God, I've been prideful. I've been arrogant. I've tried to solve this all on my own, but I come to you. I'm not good enough, but your goodness is enough. Forgive me my sins. Give me your grace. Forgive me. And I give you my life in exchange. Jesus says people who don't know God and the way he works are always worrying about these things. Non-believers have a lot of good reasons to worry. I understand why non-believers turn to all the bad stuff they do to cope with. I understand. That's their God. But we as Christians should only turn to God. And when we don't, we're acting like an unbeliever. We're calling God a liar. There are over 5,467 promises from God in the Bible to take care of your needs. Are you trusting them? Quit acting like an orphan. you got almost 5,500 promises from God in this book about meeting your needs. So trust them. I found this interesting. According to the Bureau of Standards, a dense fog covering seven city blocks to a depth of 100 feet contains less than one glass of water. All of that fog, if it could be condensed into water, wouldn't quite fill a drinking glass. That amount of water is divided into about 60 billion tiny droplets. Yet when these minute particles settle over a city or countryside, they can almost blot out everything from sight. Now compare this to things we often worry about. Like fog, our worries can thoroughly block our vision of the light of God's promises, but the fact is they have little substance to them. Worry is a fog. It blinds you from seeing the truth and the promises of God's word. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 32 this, your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So how many times do you act like God isn't going to do this? How many times do you think, well, you know, God's not going to take care of my sexual needs. He's not going to take care of my financial needs. He's not going to take care of my social needs. He's not going to take care of my career needs. Yes, he will if you'll let him. Worries and unbelief. You're just saying, I don't trust God. Let me, let me be even more blunt. Every time you worry, you're acting like an atheist. An atheist doesn't even believe there is a God. You're acting like there's no God at all. It's just up to you to take care of this. I'm just out here on my own. I mean, worry is practical atheism. It says, I really don't believe God is going to help me with this. So we start depending on ourselves. We start taking matters in our own hands, and we assume that we, we have to figure it out rather than just trusting God. And that's called playing God. You know what? That's a poor testimony. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and you worry all the time, you're a lousy witness to the world. Why do you think people don't want to go to church? I don't want to go there. Oh, they, they praise Jesus, but they worry when they walk out the door. How can we convince a lost world that our God is a good shepherd who will take care of us if we act like he doesn't take care of us? Worry says, I don't believe God. I don't trust God. And some of you, you trust him to a point, you start thinking, well, you know, things are going pretty good right now. But when is the next shoe going to fall? There's a whole book in the Bible about a man named this. His name was Job. 
I mean, Job was filthy rich. He'd probably be like the Bill Gates of our day. He was well-known. He was very beloved. He was very successful, very famous. But Job had a problem. He's always waiting for the next shoe to fall. And when it did, this is the number one quote he would say in Job 3.25. Everything I fear and worry about and dread comes true. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Some of you, bad things happen. You go, I knew that was going to happen. I knew it was coming. You know anybody like that? Don't point to them in here, okay? They're just waiting for the next shoe to fall. I mean, let me, here's a question. Do you think God ever worries? I'm sorry. Do you ever think he worries? So why are you worrying? Do you believe this book or not? Do you trust God or not? When you don't, you say, you're a liar. I'm an atheist. I don't believe you. As for me and my house, we believe him. And the world needs to see that we believe him. Jesus put it this way in John 14, 1. Don't worry or surrender to your fear. For you believed in God, now trust and believe in me also. So how do you do that? That's part two next week. I'm making you wait. Why would I give you part two today when I'm not sure you're going to do part one this week? I read about a woman whose husband of 40 years had died. Suddenly, for months, she just sat alone in her house, being depressed and worried about her life. And Finally, she decided to do something about her situation. She remembered that a friend of hers owned a pet store. And she thought, you know, I need a pet. I need some companion that will take be here with me and take care of me and all these things and love me. And so she... Went down to this pet store, and this friend of hers kept showing her all these different pets, cats and dogs, and and nothing really appealed to her. And he said, well, I do have this prized parrot. It talks. It will talk your head off. She goes, really? It really does talk? He says, really? It's a chatterbox. Everyone comes into the store and is astounded by this parrot's friendly disposition and extreme wide vocabulary. So she bought the expensive parrot and took it home. At last, I have a companion who will talk to me. And so, a few weeks later, she walked into the pet store, and he goes, well, how's your parrot doing? Quite a talker, huh? She goes, nope, hadn't said a word since I brought it home. She says, I'm worried. Something's not right. He says, well, did you buy a mirror? Parrots like to see themselves in mirrors. He'll stare at the mirror, and then he'll just start talking. She says, I need to buy a mirror. Yeah, you need to buy a mirror. So she bought the mirror and took it home, put it in the cage. A few weeks later, she goes back to the store. How's the pet? No, nope, ain't, still ain't talking. I just looked in the mirror, but ain't said a word. All right. Um, how about a ladder? Parents love ladders. They'll go up and down that ladder. He'll look at himself in the mirror, and then he'll just start talking like a little chatterbox. She says, I need a ladder. Yeah, you need a ladder. So she bought the ladder. She took it home, put it in there, and nothing. Bird said nothing. Nothing. So she called him up. He said, just trust me. Give him time. He's got to get used to that ladder and that mirror. But he'll start going up and down the ladder, and he'll start looking at himself in the mirror, and he'll start talking. She said, all right. So she waited another week. Nothing. So she returned to the store to complain. He says, um, what's wrong now? Still not talking. Did you buy a swing? I need a mirror. I need a ladder. And I need a swing. Yeah, you need a swing. Birds love to sit in swings and go back and forth. You put, him in, you put that swing in there, and he'll be singing and talking his head off. So she bought the swing. She took it home. She put it in the cage. All right. She waited a whole week. Bird never said a word. Nothing. Nothing. Ten days goes by. So she finally flies in the store after ten days. He goes, how's the parrot? I bet no. He's dead in the bottom of my cage. That expensive bird I bought a ladder for, a mirror for. Bought a swing for, he's dead in the bottom of the cage. He says, didn't he ever say anything to you? She said, yeah, well, I was there taking his last breath. He says, don't they have any bird food down at that pet store? She worried about everything but the main thing, feeding the bird. And And that's like us. We focus on this and this and this. And it kills the joy of our salvation. It kills it. Christian writer Fred Smith says, he used to struggle with worry. He writes this, trying to break away from my worries was like wrestling an octopus. 
It can be done, but only when you are convinced God will wrap himself around you like tentacles to draw you to himself and to his repeated promises that he will meet all your needs. Until then, you're in the tentacles of worry, and like a noose, you kill spiritually. So Southside, I've given you five reasons today why worry is wrong. God is good all the time, and all the time, our God is good. Let's pray.